downpours yesterday. I could do without. Hmm. I yes, my we had like snowing. three and a quarter inches of rain yesterday in western Wisconsin, so oh. it was uh, yeah. a little rainy. I woke yeah. up this morning and checked the, my uh, Facebook, and my nephew lives in Beloit, which is south central, mm-hmm. and a gigantic gigantic tree in his yard uh, blew <gasps> over. They had um, straight line winds Uh-oh. and um, over the road and um, yeah, but no one hurt and not even the house. I mean, it, it fell, but it really fell good. away from the house. So wow. Amazing. We didn't well, have any really strong here. winds in, in Illinois too, didn't they? I thought I saw something with cornfields where the corn is all bent over because of just oh. the wind, not hail or anything like that. Yeah, well, Beloit is, you know, on the Illinois border, so. Yep, yeah. really close to that northern Illinois line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I bet that's where this mm-hmm. other thing. I was just had the weather channel on in the morning this morning, and they had pictures of all these cornfields, and they're just, they're not destroyed. The plant, the corn is still attached to the plant, but all the plants are just, it looks like somebody rolled over them. My mm-hmm. word. Huh? And just wind, they said. Nothing more than that, yeah. so. Wow. Well, I'm glad nobody got hurt because that's yes, mm-hmm. yes, me really too. Really unfortunate to have a tree uprooted like that and not hit your house is really a great thing. Yeah. Right. Well, I <laughs> yes, think we're going to go ahead and goodness. get. <laughs> I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Carmen, is that you on the line? Oh, this is Michelle from Michelle. Okay. Welcome. Good. I'm glad to have you. Are you logged in on the computer yet? I'm trying to. The thing won't <laughs> operate, but I'm getting there. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, we just are waiting on Leslie, so I'm sure he'll join us if he's available. So welcome. Um, we're going to talk about writing your annual appeal letter. Did everybody get the email that I had sent without the attachments yesterday, <laughs> finally with the attachments? Yes. Yes. Great. Did you get a chance to look at that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to just start right in talking about starting with your story. So that that form was to try to help you to find some stories that you could use for your appeal. Um, So we're just going to start with the basic assumption that you already know that an annual appeal is one of the best ways to raise funds. So I'm not going to get behind, you know, all the statistics and stuff to convince you to do this. It's something I, I think if you're here, you already know this. So where do you start when you're writing your letter? Obviously, we're going to start with a story because everybody loves a good story. So I have a little poll question for you here if you want to take a minute. Have you collected any stories for your letter yet? And if you just want to oh. click and submit your answer real quick. Oh. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm having a little, you know, I'll get it. I'll get there. Okay, here we go. But I've got a good excuse as to why I've not started collecting that one because Michelle and I just finished doing the September newsletter that had a great story in and our August donor appeal letter, which had a great story in. So we'll start on the next one soon. You've written a couple you really like to come up with another one. (laughs) I have to be excited about the story to use it. If I don't like the story, then I'm stumped. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Yeah, and, and yeah, after and, you've written a newsletter and then your your August appeal, yeah, then it's kind mm-hmm. of like, well, now what do we use? Correct. Well, <laughs> I'm sure there's a great story out there that's coming. So exactly, exactly. It's just a matter of finding it. So and sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but most of the time, I think we can get to those pretty quickly. All right. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and skip to the results here. So nobody has found their story yet, including me. <laughs> <laughs> we're all not, and I wouldn't say we're behind at this point in time. It's just that's where we need to start. And we know why we need stories, right? Because stories connect people. They help them to see the point to your mission, to what you're doing, and why they should be a part of it. So when you're looking for your stories, as you know, you want to find something that's emotionally connecting your reader to your organization to make them say, hey, you know, I could be the hero in this story and I could help you know, to solve this issue, whatever's going on. So how do you find your story? Use that form. Talk to your staff if you have staff, board members, volunteers, even your clients. You know, interview them. Go visit with them and just talk to people to try to find out what's been going on if you're not familiar with it. You know, for me, most of the time I know 
what's going on with most of the people. So I'll say, you know, to Kelly, my assistant, you know, oh, what did we do for Alice over here last week? I, wasn't there something really interesting with her? And, you know, and I might go meet with Alice. I might just call her on the phone, you know, and try to find out as much as I can um, and just to find the right story. So just start talking to people. Try to train your volunteers to share what's going on. The more that they can share with you what's going on, even if it seems like the really mundane, everyday kind of things, the more stories you'll have to draw from. So some questions that you can ask, and some of these were on that form. What was their challenge, their problem? How did you address that? Are they better off now? And if they're not, why not? And is it something that a donor could help with? Is it something because you just don't have enough resources, you need to hire another person, you know, whatever it is, so that you can solve this problem for the person and help them to get beyond that? When you're looking for your story, forget what you know, because you already know too much. You know more than your reader is going to know. <laughs> so just get all of that. Throw that out the window. Don't even think about it, okay? Your job is to be the bridge between your reader and your organization. So you want to make sure that you're giving them all the details that are already in your head that you might pass over when you're telling your story so that they can make that connection to you. So go back to the beginning. Go back and think about why you do what you do, why you care about the people that you're helping, and what keeps you connected. Reconnect with that. Think about, you know, when you were first starting at your organization, what, what did, why did you want the job? How were you planning to make a difference? Why did you think this was a good thing? Um, think about the people that you have known the longest. What are their stories? I would bet that you probably know them very well by now because you've developed a relationship with them, right? So like for me, leaving my position here in Marathon County makes me concerned, not worried, but concerned about the people that we serve, the ones that I have personally gotten to know over these last almost nine years, and I care about them very much. They're amazing people, and they have amazing stories to share, and that's where you want to get back to is to that passion and share their stories. There was a lady that I had talked to. I, I love her story. I don't know that it's a great donor story, but I think that if I thought about it long enough, I could probably turn it into a good story. Um, she had been living in Illinois. Her children were pretty young. Her husband was killed in an accident at work. And so she moved back to Wisconsin, um, to Wausau, because her grandmother lived here. This is where she grew up. She thought it would be a great place to raise her kids. And she's all by herself in the early 60s with five young children. So she buys this home. And one day she's outside hanging the laundry on the clothesline, and the neighbor from the house behind her walks over, and he says, I understand your husband died. And she said, yeah. And he said, my wife died too. You want to have dinner? What a great pickup line, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my wife died too. You want to have dinner? What? Yeah. <laughs> what a, and she ended up marrying him. So, you know, that, that's just how these people all have such great life stories to share and I think that shows personality. You know, a lot of those little types of things that you just say, well, that's just a great little anecdote, you know, not really a whole lot of a, a story there. But you go further into that. Get a little bit more information. And why do I care about this lady? And why should you, and why should you, the donor, help us to help her? So that's what you're looking for is those kinds of um, stories that connect emotionally with your reader. So as you're choosing your story, again, um, choose a success story that appeals to the emotions of your readers. Talk about how lives are being changed and improved and make your mission personal to them. Like, um, where do you want to be when you're growing older? Where, where would you like to live? What kinds of things would you like to do? And help them to see themselves or somebody they know in the story that you're sharing. So any questions at this point in time? So if I can make the next slide come up, we'll be doing good. Um, describe your work in a donor-friendly way. Help them to understand what you're doing. Remember, this is the forget what you know. Make sure that you put it in terms that everybody can understand and they get a picture of what's going on. They can just visualize this. Donors want to know how their money is making a difference. So you need to be telling them you know, that if you give $35 now, we can provide rides for Helen or you know, whatever it is to get to her um, uh, therapy or, you know, however you want to phrase that so that people can see that my dollars 
are making a difference to help seniors in our community, specifically Helen, and I can relate to Helen, okay? So the goal is to call people to action, to make a gift, to volunteer, or to do something else that furthers your mission. So you're sharing your story, and your story is motivating and compelling them to do one of these things or all of these things. So here's a story about a lady named Ruth. Um, I had just used her story in our fall appeal letter. What Ruth wanted um, was really just to be able to stay in her home and avoid nursing home care. I have known her for the last eight years, and you know she was the first person I thought of when I was thinking, okay, a good fall appeal story, what can I use? So I called her, and I went over and visited with her, and I asked her a few questions to make sure I had my facts straight. And initially I was thinking that she's just a pretty typical client. She's elderly. She lives alone. She can do a lot of things on her own, but due to her age and, like me, her inability to stretch because she's really short, her lack of weight oh, yeah. lifting skills. <laughs> <laughs> she just needs a little extra help with things like her husband used to do before he died. You know, she can't lift things up out of the basement and bring them upstairs when she wants to. Or like this, we had this volunteer come and he helped paint her house. We had a few others that helped. And it's just not something that she could do anymore. But, you know, I was trying to decide whether or not her story was compelling or not. Was this something that would make a donor be interested? She's a really spunky lady, and she just doesn't give up. She told me she likes to walk around the block because you can't just sit around doing nothing. So she walks around the block every day 15 times because she just likes that number. So I thought that was pretty <laughs> great. And when it's raining, she rides her stationary bike. What's really great about her is that she celebrated her 99th birthday last February oh in my. her home where she oh. wanted to stay. Oh my. That's where I decided – this was a compelling story because for the last nine years, we've helped her to be able to stay in that home by providing her with rides for her medical appointments, grocery shopping. Her, she was matched with this volunteer, Scott, who um, does all these little handyman jobs for her. She says that he can do anything. He fixes leaky faucets, changes her light bulbs, cuts the grass, you know, shovels the snow in the wintertime, and he brings his family over, and they all help out, and she gets to visit with people. And it really helps her to feel connected. And had she not had these volunteers helping her, I can't help but think that there's a possibility she would have been very disconnected from the community and probably would have got, had to at least go to assisted living because she can't even drive anymore. But being able to have these connections has helped her. And wouldn't you want that for your mom, for yourself, for your grandmother, you know, whoever it is in your family. So I took that angle with this story. One of the things about her is that, you know, she just makes me smile when I see her, when she calls on the phone. You know, she's one of those people that most people could relate to. They know somebody like Ruth. And so that's why I chose this particular story. There's nothing really completely amazing other than being 99, I think, is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But she's pretty typical. You know, it's not really, you know, something – all that out of the ordinary, but I thought that people could relate, and so that's why I use this story. Have you guys heard of Humans of New York, that little um, photography project that's going on? No, you I have not. You may have seen some pictures on Facebook, oh. no? Mm -hmm. There's this photographer, um, and I can't recall his name. He decided one day that he wanted to just capture pictures of people that would show what real-life people are in New York. Oh, his name was Brandon Stanton, that's what it was. And he has spent the last couple of years taking pictures. And then he decided, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So he's trying to get some stories. So I looked up um, Humans of New York and just looked for a few of their stories. And they're really, if he was doing this for fundraising purposes, I think he could raise quite a bit of money. And I think it would be good for you to take a look at their website and just read some of these stories. They're very short. They're mostly Facebook posts. But you get the idea, and you could develop a letter around these stories. So take, for instance, this young man here is a 13-year-old boy. He was a student at Mott Hall Bridges Academy. And he was just asked um, who the most influential person in his life is. And he said it was his principal, Ms. Lopez. He said, when we get in trouble, she doesn't suspend us. She calls us to her office and explains to us how society was built down around us. And she tells us that each time somebody fails out of school, a new jail cell gets built. And one time she made every student stand up, one at a time, and she told each of us that we matter. 
this photo, this particular one, went viral, over 1 million shares. And he continued to chronicle the life inside of this academy where he learned that the principal there was in the middle of raising money to send her students on a trip to Harvard because she knew that having dreams could be hard if you didn't have a picture of it in your mind, which is what you're trying to do with your donor. And she wanted college, but not just any college, to be in the forefront of their minds. So she wanted to send a message to the kids that, yes, that they could not only create their dreams, but they could make those dreams real. So she raised enough money to send most of her students to, for a trip to visit Harvard and a scholarship fund named after this student. It's a pretty cool story. And you could see where you could get a donor involved in something like that to help these kids you know, be able to reach for something and get out of where they are. Okay, so that's one example. And again, go to their website, just Google Humans of New York, and you'll find the project. This next one, this is where we're, we would be getting into more like pictures going along with your story and choosing what kind of photographs might um, really help to get the point across. What I liked about this one is not so much the story. This was just where um, the photographer had taken a picture of this guy's feet because he didn't want his picture to be out there. And um, he just asked him, you know, what was going on. The caption with this picture was, my girlfriend and I aborted a child a couple of weeks ago. The driver said, I'm sorry for your loss. He said, we didn't lose anything. It was a choice. He asked, were both of you equally on board with the decision? And he said, she followed my lead, which made it tougher, I guess, but I've got so much going on right now, and she just opened her own theater show. It's just not the right time. The photographer asked, how has the aftermath been? And the guy responded, you know, I always thought of abortion as a common thing. I'm a liberal guy, pro-choice and everything, but I never imagined how bloody painful it was going to be. What I like about this picture with that story, the story makes me feel very sad, very, you know, it makes me hurt for these people. But with, with this particular picture, this is the guy's shoes. He was actually wearing these. This, the shoes are broken and sad and worn out. And I think that what he was responding to in these questions made him sound exactly like these shoes. And it was a really great connection, don't you think? So this yeah. is kind of what you're looking for. When you're looking for pictures, you want it to tie to your story. And your story needs to evoke em or provoke emotions. You want to make sure that you're making that connection with your reader. So go there and look and see what kinds of stories are out there. And, you know, it might help you to come up with some ideas and as you're thinking about the people and collecting your own stories. Last year I used this particular picture. This is just a canned picture that I purchased online because I didn't um, – I don't want to use pictures of my clients um, because, you know, we're in a small enough community, everybody knows everybody, and when you start mm -hmm. sharing a little bit of information about people, they don't really want you to do that, and it, it might be embarrassing for some. Um, so we try to protect everybody's identity, and I use canned photographs. And what I usually do is just make sure that they're not something that I have seen before. There's that uh, Got an Hour campaign that's going on, um, and one of the photographs that came on those postcards I have seen that in lots of advertisements recently. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, you know, you just got to kind of look at what you're choosing, what you're buying, and make sure it's not something that looks too, that you're seeing around places. Like AARP buys their photos, too, online, same places. Because I've seen a lot of their stuff at a couple of these different websites. iStockphoto.com is one of them. So you just kind of got to watch that. But this is Helen. She lives alone in her home. And this is, this is the basic story that I gave for my appeal letter last year. She doesn't have children or family nearby. Her income's just barely enough to cover her basic monthly expenses. And she was getting by at least until one day last March when she fell. After a short hospital stay, her doctors ordered physical therapy treatments three times a week. Now, transportation for physical therapy is $24 for each appointment. Her weekly grocery budget is only $30. So it wasn't long before Helen was having financial problems, and she was forced to choose between physical therapy and buying groceries. So the day she went into the physical therapist and told her she wasn't going to be coming back for more appointments was the first time that she felt hopeful in a long time because her therapist referred her to Faith in Action. And we were able to take her to her therapy appointments and for grocery shopping and other medical care. And she didn't have to choose between medical care and food. People can relate to food and medical care. They get it. You know, you need to have both of those things. These are basic needs to be met. 
And when we have seniors living in our community who are having to choose between medical care and food, most people would tell you that that's unacceptable and would be willing to help. So just another example, and this, this story went very well. We had a great response from that appeal letter. So you've got your story now, right? You've looked for some pictures to try to tie this all together, and now you want to start writing. So everything that I have read in my research says to start at the end, and what is the point? That doesn't seem very logical, but we often lose the point in what we're writing. We get kind of passionate about these stories, and it sounds really good to me, but to the reader who doesn't have all that knowledge that I have about what we do every day and all these people that we see, you might just totally miss that whole point as they're reading through your letter. So start with the point. Decide what your most compelling problem is. When you stuff your letter with too many other messages, they all compete for your reader's attention, and then you'll lose focus on your appeal, and you'll end up with lower response rates because people just don't see what the point to it is. So start at the end and start with your PS, your postscript. Ninety percent of all readers will read the postscript first. So that's where your main point needs to go. So this one, we included a note that Helen had sent us. I'm alone, but thankful that I can still take care of myself and for your help with the things I can't do. Without faith in action, I would have no other options. So it ties the story all back together, focusing right back on Helen and how you've helped her. Great idea. That, that's where you want, you know, if you, we were fortunate enough to have gotten a thank you note from her. We don't always have those kinds of things. I'm sure, Karen, you have the same issue. Mm -hmm. where, and so I might call and just talk, talk about mm -hmm. what's been going on, how things are, and see if I can get a quote that I can use and then ask for permission to use that. Um, when she sent us this little note, I called her and asked her, is it all right if I use that? And, of course, I've changed her name to protect her, so nobody <laughs> knows where it's coming from. But you don't have to change names if you just use first names. Most people don't have any idea anyway. Do not make your PS a tax deduction note. People don't give because they want the tax deduction. That's not usually the primary motivator for a donation. And in most cases, that's just kind of insulting. Just help them to find the point. Make the PS the point of your letter. Make it easy. Make it count. They already know it's tax deductible, so leave all of that stuff for your receipts. And if you have an actual note like this, use that. If you send out surveys, if you have a comment spot where people can write in whatever comments they have, save those. Use those, too, for your PS, for your newsletter, just little notes from your clients. That kind of stuff is very, very helpful. So uh, move excuse along me. To I'm not following. I'm, I have a question. Sure. So you're, are you saying that actually there should be a physical PS yep. that re reiterates the Helen story but that the Helen story should also be the first point of your letter, right? Your letter should yes. tell the Helen story, and then yes, the PS exactly. should reemphasize the Helen story? Exactly. Because if you look back, if we go back to that here, let me pull that back up. Helen said, I'm thankful that I can still take care of myself, but without faith in action, I would have no other option. So you're seeing that. If that's the first thing you read, you know, okay, Faith in Action is doing something good, and without them, she would not know what to do. She, there's nowhere else to turn. So, And you know it's an appeal letter when, the minute you open it, right? So you know they're looking for money, but let's, and oh, Helen is thankful that she can take care of herself. And then that kind of entices me to want to read her story. Okay? So you're putting that there just to make it easy for your reader to get the point. Does that make sense? Um, so are, you're saying that when when someone opens up an appeal letter, they read the PS first. Ninety percent of people read the PS first. There was a study done, you know, where they follow the eyes of a person reading a document. That is the first thing your eyes look at by ninety percent of the people. Oh, I must be a strange person. But anyway, <laughs> so what you're saying is that PS needs to reiterate and somehow restate the story that you tell, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Yep. It should so be the cliff notes of your story. Yeah. Exactly. 
Now, when you've okay. read magazine articles, you've seen where there's like a little box of text pulled out in the middle of the article, and maybe the rest of the words are all around it. Now, That's I read those text. first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So they do that to get you to read the story. Same idea, and you could do that in your letter as well. You know, just put mm -hmm. that off to the side somewhere. I don't, Karen, do you do that in your newsletters at all? No, I don't, but I was recently reading that that's a really good idea to put that box of really large letters <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. in the middle of the article because people will read that first, and if they're interested, then they go back and start at the beginning, hopefully. Exactly, and it's one of those things that just kind of captures the attention. So you could do that in the letter too, but don't go nuts with it. One of them, just having one, is plenty. I did this in a newsletter article, and that um, we had a quote from a client, and she said, "Faith in action is a godsend," and I just really liked that. So I put mm -hmm. that in a little box in the middle of the article and put all the words around it. And people, I got a lot of comments on that article, and it was a guy. I didn't think it was anything really special, but I think that got people to read it, read it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. doing whatever you can to captivate that reader and get them interested, so they actually look at all the paper. And, you know, they don't look at it and say, oh, that's too many words, because, you know, that's what I tell you all the time. I look at things and, yeah, that's too many words. I don't have time right now. And then I set it aside, and I may never come back to it. So whatever you can yeah. do to make that PS interesting enough to get them to start reading the letter, do that. Okay? Oh, that's an interesting point. Man, I had no idea. No, I didn't either. It wasn't until I started doing a lot of research on how to write annual appeal letters, and I was just kind of thrown to the wind here to try to figure this all out a few years ago. And I came across these things, and my letters, as my letters improved and as I used some of these techniques, I saw greater amounts of donations coming in. And it's just little itty-bitty things like this that you would think, yeah, nobody really cares about that, but it does make a difference. So when you're looking at your P.S., Maybe you could think of some of these things to help you write that. Like if there's an urgent deadline, you know, by December 20th, if we receive your donation by December 20th, a uh, generous donor will match all of the funds. You know, something like that would be a great PS. Um, or if there's a call to action, won't you help Helen to be able to stay in her home or to get to her physical therapy or something like that? And as you're looking at your story, figure out who is the anchor and use her, him, whoever the story is about in your PS to reinforce what you're trying to get across, and again, to hook them into reading your entire story. So just a few ideas there for your PS. Like here's an example. I did an um, annual appeal letter where I included a, um, an overhead sheet that I printed black circles on. And at the beginning of the letter, I asked the person to take this plastic sheet and hold it over their eye and try to see their letter through this black circle. And, you know, it was pointing out the idea that if you had macular degeneration, it's really hard to do simple things. So the PS I had on that is after the eye test I asked you to do, you were able to see again just by taking that plastic square away from your eye. Our senior neighbors can't fix their vision, but with your help, they can remain safely in their homes. So there's an example. Um, Helen's note, which you already saw, um, and then here, if you give $25 today, your gift will be matched by a generous anonymous donor, or your gift of whatever makes whatever possible, transportation, um, Helen can remain in her home safely, you know, whatever it might be, but that helps that person to get the idea of what's going on in this letter, okay? All right, so now you're thinking, what about the letter? When do we actually get to that? We spent all this time writing the end, and the P.S., how do we ever get around to writing? Well, don't worry, we will get there. If you start with your P.S., and then you start thinking about your little remit device, that's the thing you want them to fill out and mail back with their donation, then the letter itself will pretty much write itself. If you don't make it easy for your donors to give, then you're sunk. You're not going to get anywhere with it. So you want to make sure that you go back to that important point that you found when you wrote your P.S., and make that what your reply device is all about. So here's an example of, um, well, not a picture of one yet. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. But you want to think about what is it going to look like. Is it going to be a slip of paper, a piece of cardstock with some options on it, a return envelope? Will you put a stamp on it? You want to think of all of these kinds of things before you get into writing your letter and make sure that that piece is connected. So 
a sample one might be just a little card that goes in, and it has to fit. If you're using number nine envelopes, make sure it fits in the number nine, and they don't have to fold it or do anything with it to send it back. If you, we use little insert envelopes that have a flap, and on the inside of the flap, you fill out your name, address, all of that kind of thing. If it's a donation in memory of or in honor of somebody, that's listed there. If you want to be a friend or a sponsor, you know, you have little boxes to check for various levels because that can motivate donors to give because they want to be known as a silver donor if they donated $500 or what have you. And this is just completely arbitrary numbers that I came up with to put on our little remit envelope. Nothing, nothing spectacular about it, but I made it numbers like $25, $50 because it seemed – like you weren't asking for too much, it was attainable, something your average donor could do, and the various levels, then we print that in our newsletter and in our annual report, and then people get the recognition that they might be looking for. So any questions about this? I do have a couple of examples of what else to include besides the obvious stuff. Um, flatter your donor by beginning with the assumption that they are good people who care about seniors. So at the top of it, say yes. I want to help seniors remain independent with a little box they can check. And then include your contact information on it too, your website, email address, phone number, and your name, so that they have all of that handy. Even though they're going to be sending it back to you, they want to see who's going to get it. So make sure you do that. And here's an example of one. This one, I don't know if you can read this very well, but yes, I will help care for our neighbors in need. I want to give, and then there's a blank, how you write in how much today, or I want to establish a recurring gift of however much a month. My check is enclosed. Please remind me if you wanted to be a monthly donor, then you know, have a program set up to remind monthly donors you know, your donation is due. If you take credit card donations, they would fill all of that in there too. Um, there's Gift societies listed on this particular one and, you know, various levels. And then you, if you wanted to choose where your donation could go to, there are a lot of choices here. I would keep this so much more simple. Don't make them work that hard. I think that just slows the process down and people will think, oh, I don't have time for all that right now, you know, and they might set it aside and you may never see that donation. So just keep it simple. I want to give whatever amount. I want it to be in honor of, in memory of, whatever that is. I want you to acknowledge my gift in your newsletter, so there's a box if they want to be anonymous or not, and then make sure you keep track of that. I think on this one it does say, I do not want my name to appear in print. We just ask if they want to be anonymous or they want to be in the newsletter, and it's a yes or a no, very simple, and then we keep track of that and make sure all the no's never show up in a newsletter or anything else. Okay, and these are things, I print these using Publisher, and you can set them up to print three per page, and I send them off to like Digicopy or another printer and have them print and cut them so I'm not standing around, or I get volunteers to come in and cut so that I'm not standing around having to do all of that. But what I would do with this and what I did with the one with the macular degeneration is I had a picture of a woman on there, and then that black circle of what it looks like when you have macular degeneration and you're trying to see what your vision would look like on the reply card. So it tied it all back into my letter. They got the idea. So if that got separated from the letter, oh, I remember now, Faith, that's for faith in action. This was because this poor lady can't see, and we really need to do something to help people with macular degeneration. So you get the connections there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So then the next thing is your envelope. Now, this would get your attention if you got this one in the mail. <laughs> I would probably open one that came like this just because it's so different. But remember that your envelope matters because it's the first impression your donor will get, and your envelope will decide whether or not they are going to open it. So I have lots of samples here. Here's one. This at my house, I'm going to shred that and put that in the recycling. I will not even bother to open it or look at it. Just another credit card application. So they're not doing a good job of getting me to open that. Making health care decisions can be hard. Getting reliable information can be even harder. Again, I would shred that. Disabled American veterans, very plain, nothing to make me want to open it, but they're relying on their name to get their donors to open these envelopes. Some bigger places, like um, maybe the United Way or Big Brothers, Big Sisters, whatever's big in your community, can get away with these kinds of things. I don't know that we could at this point in time, at least not here in Marathon County. We need something to entice people. 
Here's one from Planned Parenthood, more unintended pregnancies and six easy steps. I would probably want to see what they're saying in that letter. That's getting a little more of my attention. And you can see on this one they have that nonprofit stamp on it. You pay, I don't know, Karen, what do you pay, like four cents or five cents five, a piece? Five cents. That, mm -hmm. Five cents a piece for those now. And then it looks more like a real letter, a real stamped letter. And some people won't read it if it's a bulk mail. They just put them right in the recycling. So that's another way to get past those kinds of things. Another thing some places do is they'll put like, oh, don't miss this ultimate offer. And I'm thinking, well, what's the ultimate offer? And it's free. So I guess I should open it instead of just throwing it in the garbage can. i got to find out what it is. It's kind of enticing me to know. And it's free, so I, I have to open this one. So you, know, you, you see what kind of little more thing toys they're using to, just you to open an envelope. And you need to think about that as you're designing yours. Now, this one I think is a spectacular idea. Can you tell that that's just a white paper lunch bag? They mail no. oh, their appeal yeah. letter in a white paper lunch bag. And I didn't think you could mail something in that, but yes, you can. Now, what's neat about this one, this came from United Farm Workers. It's just so unique and so different. I would open it just based on that alone. The reason why they used a paper bag, and there's nothing else on the outside. You know, it says United Farm Workers, wherever it came from, that's it. But in their letter, they talked about United Farm Workers are very low paid, and half of their pay goes to their health care, and their health care doesn't cover most anything, and they're all getting sick because of the pesticides that are being sprayed on these plants that they're harvesting, and they need to see a physician so that they can, you know, be treated for whatever problems are going on, and they're being told by the company that they're working for that, you know, they have some, one person was told they had a vaginal infection, but they had upper respiratory symptoms, to try to shame them from talking about it or going to any doctor. And this is what their story was all about. And so they sent it in a bag like this because in the country where these people happen to work, all of their medications come in a white paper lunch bag like this. So it tied in perfectly. It was a really great idea. And I can send, I did, I have a sent for you for this afternoon. Um, I have attached everything to an email so you'll get all the PowerPoint and all of that, the sample letter that went with this. I would take this and use this in a faith and action kind of way. Every year during the holidays we do a food drive, and we bring bags of staples like peanut butter and jelly and spaghetti dinners and things that are really simple for a senior to prepare that they don't have to spend a lot of time standing in the kitchen or do a lot of work to prepare these meals, and we bring them in paper bags. So why not use a brown paper lunch bag to mail asking for donations for we call it a gift of hope or a bag of hope? Why not ask for donations like that? And then when they send it back, their remit envelope is a brown paper bag that's all ready to go. All they have to do is stick their donation in it and use the seal that you've included. And now it really is a bag of hope because your donation is in, it, is in it, and it makes it possible for us to purchase the food that we're going to give to these seniors. Hmm. Wow. So when you're looking online for, you know, I do this all the time. I'm always researching and looking for ideas of what other places are doing. You might get an idea like that for a way to tie it into what you're already doing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So look for things that will help you to get your envelopes open. Another sample, you know, if you put something out there, two free thank you gifts. If some people will open it. It's usually going to be like a bookmark and address labels. I wouldn't open that one. Um, and think about would you open it as you're coming up with these things? Would you open that based on what you have on the outside? Here's an example, a gathering storm of anti-Jewish hate. And this is where fear works to get people opening envelopes, reading stories, making donations. Another one here, here's another fear example. This one I really like because I got one of these in the mail too. This looks like it's in a really official document from the IRS, but it's actually an advertisement for the local car dealership. Oh. So they're scaring you into opening this so you can oh find out they're having God. some sale on cars. I would never buy a car from them. <laughs> And not not at all because I just I don't like the way that that's being done. Yeah. So yet another example, um, you've probably seen some of these. This is from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. They sent nickels to people to help save a child's life, and so I would probably open this one simply because there's a nickel on it, and most people are not going to put a nickel without too much guilt into the garbage can, right? So right. this mm -hmm. 
is, you know, just another example. I don't know. It certainly that. doesn't guarantee they'll read the letter, though. No, it doesn't. It means you're giving away nickels. That's what I yeah, think right. it means. Yeah. I don't think it, it right. gets more donations for any. March of Dimes does the same thing, and they yeah. mail dimes. But mm-hmm. really, you're just giving away a lot of dimes. And some people, you know, because they care about the cause, they will donate anyway. But I don't think you need these really gimmicky kind of things. I think you're yeah. better off to tie your story to your envelope. Like yeah. this next one is a good example. There's a picture of a homeless man. Help us reach out to the people who need us most this Christmas. Okay, that ties your story and gets people into reading it and understanding what is this all about. And it doesn't have to be expensive and fancy like this. It just could be a little teaser about, um, Karen, you have some examples. that you, Can you think of any off the top of your head where you have used for some of your letters? Well, we put teasers on the outside of most of our uh, letters that we send out, and we just print them on mailing labels and then just affix them to the front or the back of the envelope as it's going out. So um, one of them was, um, if you couldn't drive, what would you do? And yep. then, you know, so then you would open it up and go from there. So um, sometimes the teasers tie into it. You know, if you're 99 years old, you know, and something happens, you know, so we print them and then stick them on. And it, it's very simple. It doesn't cost anything more Correct. than the labels and the ink. Right. So you're mm-hmm. not, you know, going to a printer. Like this one obviously is a more expensive envelope. Yeah. We would mm-hmm. not do something like this because the cost would just be too much. And, you know, depending on the volume that you're sending, you, you have to take all of that into account. And if you have volunteers who will come in and stick labels on your envelopes, mm-hmm. which I assume most of us have, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really simple, very easy. You just have all the stuff ready to go, tell them where you want it to be on the envelope, and it's all taken care of. So that's pretty much it for the envelopes. Is there any questions on that? Okay, so as you're thinking about your envelope, what should it look like? Should you use a stamp? I think that's a good way to get it open, and you go to the post office and you purchase those five-cent stamps, And then when you send it for the mailing, you don't pay more. That five cents is in in addition to what you would normally pay for your bulk mailing. It's taken off of the the full price. You still pay, ours is like 11 cents a piece Mm -hmm. if you do a regular number 10 envelope and then we're mailing in bulk. So that five cents would just be taken off of each piece. Should you include pictures on the envelope? How much is it going to cost? Is it worth it? You know, what color should your envelope be? Should it be white? Should the addresses be handwritten? Should they be on labels? And in my experience, I don't know if anybody else has had, you know, checked these kinds of things. It doesn't seem to make any difference if you handwrite the address or if you put a label on it. Our response rate is the same. And I've tried um, white envelopes and I've tried some other Christmassy colored ones, I don't think that makes a difference either. So I would say save your money, keep it simple, put a teaser on the outside, um, maybe use the stamp because I, that's not costing you anything more, and your volunteers are putting them on, so it's not as if you have to do more work for that. Um, but if it gets people to open the, env- the envelope, then it, I think that's well worth it. But you don't think white or colored makes a difference, right? I don't think it makes a difference. I think that paper bag would make a big difference. I think if we sent our appeal letters in a Something round paper really bag, unusual. Yeah. it's very unusual. People will notice that when they bring in their mail, and they're going to be thinking, these people are nuts mailing me a lunch bag. You know? <laughs> so they're going to open it and want to find out why. And even if you didn't mail the outside envelope as that brown paper bag, I don't know if you could handle the response envelope being the brown paper bag, if that would be too confusing. I think you have to kind of do both of them the same way. And tying it together in your letter as, you know, insert your donation and make this a bag of hope. I think that would be a fantastic way to get people involved. And then next year you got to try to top that, (laughs) which is always frightening to me to come up with something Mm -hmm. that will be equally interesting to get people to want to give and to open your letters. So just some ideas. You know, obviously take things one step at a time. If you've never done an appeal letter before, focus on the letter. Write a really good letter. Do a teaser, just a very simple teaser on the outside of the envelope, and keep it simple. And then each time you write another appeal letter, try something different and see what the responses are. How much difference does it make in what you're doing? And keep track of those kinds of things so you know. That's all. When you start writing, 
one of the first things you should think about is how personal can you get? Because we don't get to meet many of our donors face-to-face. What can you do to reach out and touch your donors with your appeal? So write the letter like you talk. Don't write it very formal. Write it as if you are speaking directly to that person. And, you know, people respond to people. So can you send different letters to different donors, maybe to one letter for board members, one letter for ongoing donors, one letter for lapsed donors, maybe a different letter for volunteers? If you have the capacity to do that, I think you'll see better response rates. And, you know, the more personalized it feels to the reader, the more likely you are to receive a donation from them. So, you know, just try to think of those things in what ways, what kind of capacity you have to handle various situations. If you can't segment and do donors and lapse donors and you're just going to send out one generalized letter, keep that in mind that some people have never given, some people give all the time, some people haven't given for a while, and make sure that the letter would be appealing to all three categories. If you can segment your um, mailing list, definitely do that. Spend the time and do that. And Maybe you can get a volunteer who can help you with that. Personalize your letters. Use their first name of the donor. Do a mail merge, because if you write, dear friend, that really is the kiss of death on your appeal. If I get a letter, you know, that's just dear mailbox recipient, yeah. <laughs> that's in the garbage. I'm not going to, you don't even know who I am. Just like these telemarketers who call and cannot pronounce your name, I often tell them when you figure out how to pronounce my name, I'll talk to you. Call me back then, because <laughs> it, it gets just maddening sometimes. You want my money, but you don't care enough to find out anything about me. So make sure and make sure you've got the spellings right on their names. Ask oh, and you said of, use their first name. I'm yes, sorry, did I? I was thinking. I think I lost track. Yeah, no, that's okay. Use their first name. If you're you're addressing the letter to Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, but then say, dear John and Sally, for the salutation in the letter. Okay. Make it personal for them. If you don't know them very well and you really want to get down to the nitty-gritty on that and you're going to write Mr. and Mrs. Smith in, in your salutation, that's fine. But I think I would try to use first names for everybody. And then ask board members and volunteers and staff members to write personal notes on the appeal letter to people that they know. You know, Pull out those letters and have them just jot a little PS or a note or something like that uh, or even to write something on a Post-it note and stick it on the letter. I volunteer with this organization because, and I think it's really great, you know, something like that, and you should too. You should donate. I support this organization because they help people, um, you know, get to their doctor appointments, and we need a community that cares about seniors. You know, whatever it is, you don't have to tell them what to write, but any little personal note that they could include would make their the people they know more likely to give because this person I know and trust already trusts you guys, so I think I can trust you too. Okay. Okay, Colleen, my um, understanding with that is that um, if you start personalizing, like, the, the notes and different uh, postscripts on the bottom, then that probably needs to go by first-class postage. Yes, if you pull those few out, yes, you are right. Yep. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. If they are not all the same mm-hmm. and the post office pulls out a random letter and it doesn't look like the other letters, then you'll have to pay a fee, a fine, and you'll have to pay first-class postage for everything. So if you're pulling out certain Mm -hmm. letters because you know that person, they're getting something Mm -hmm. a little bit different, you have to put regular 49-cent stamps on those. Correct. But you're going to return your – the the amount that comes back in that envelope will more than make up for the (laughs) 49-cent. Exactly. (laughs) It's well worth it, yeah. Yeah. But you just – you have to be aware of – of those kinds mm-hmm. of things when you're doing these things. Otherwise, yeah, you can't send it bulk because they have to be the same. Correct. Um, think about emotional triggers that make people give as you're writing fear, greed, guilt, anger, exclusivity, salvation, and flattery are some of the biggest emotional triggers that make people give. Um, and I'll come back over these again in a minute. If you can, you know, try to put those kinds of things. And I look at these and think these are a lot of negative kind of emotions. And I try to to um, appeal more to empathy, you know. And I suppose that could be a little bit of fear in there too. And salvation, well, the donor's saving the day by sending in their donation to help Helen to be able to stay in her home. You know, so those are the kinds of emotions I look at. I don't try to guilt people, but, you know, some people look at it 
from everybody gets something different out of what you write. When you think of any kind of storytelling type situations, everybody takes away something a little bit different, and that's what makes us all unique. So just some ideas. Um, if you can handwrite addresses on your envelopes for your top prospects, that might get people to open the envelope because it's not doesn't look like a form letter. Uh, maybe the people who give the most or who are repeat donors, you know, that kind of thing, maybe you want to handwrite some of those. Um, and then ask them to do something personal for someone that you help. Maybe enclose a note that the donor could send back and it would be inserted into a holiday gift for your seniors. You know, something like whatever they would like to say, Merry Christmas even, you know, something very simple. But you could ask them to do that to make your, your clients feel special. So when you're writing your letter, again, don't start writing by thinking, how can I get this done as fast as I possibly can so I can move on to the next thing? Because if you're thinking that when you're writing, your readers are going to be getting that out of the letter. And you don't want them to dread getting a letter from you. You want them to give you money. You don't want them to give you money so that they don't ever have to read another letter from you or so that they feel <laughs> sorry for you so that they stop getting letters. You, know, you don't want that kind of a, a mindset from somebody reading your letter. So just try to make them look forward to getting your appeal letter. I think that, that should be your goal so that they are looking forward to seeing what's going on there now and what way can I help now. And, again, that's all through your storytelling. Part of your letter should have a headline um, that gives urgency to your letter. It should be a short phrase that grabs the reader's attention. It could be emotional and urgent. Um, and remember that the best of them appeals to your reader's deepest feelings and desires, like their faith, their worldview, their beliefs about humanity, their hope for a better world for their children, their sense of justice, fairness, that kind of thing. So use attention-grabbing headers. Because remember, again, if people are reading the PS first, the next thing they're going to do is go back to the top, and they're going to skim your letter. So you're going to want something that grabs their attention. You know, we have very short attention spans these days, so you want to grab their attention and keep it and get them to read it. So if your header does that, then you'll have somebody reading your letter. It should just introduce your story, your fact or clause, and it should be very short, less than three lines. So I have a few examples here, and these happen to be um, just general ones I found on the Internet. This is from Women's Aid. Your urgent Christmas gift of whatever, and they fill in the blank with a dollar amount, will help a woman find the courage she needs to escape a life of cruelty and abuse. That's your, your header. It gets you right away. You know what this letter is about, and it gets your attention makes you want to read the rest of the letter. Um, here's one from the Salvation Army. I like this one because, again, this kind of ties into our food drive at Christmas time. This Christmas we urgently need to reach out to people who've lost everything. And I would say um, more not people who've lost everything, but people who are alone, you know, those kinds of um, emotions. And then it goes on to say, but we can't do it without you or we need your help. Something like that, can't you help a lonely senior this Christmas time? Anything like that will get people to read your letter. So here's an example that I had used. Um, do you ever think about what you'll do when you get older? And to get people to read your letter, do you dream about retiring or moving to a warmer climate or maybe just downsizing to a condo? You know, that kind of thing. Just, and it's not at all about this lady that the story was about, but it gets people starting to read that. And then I went in to talk about what happens when you're aging when you're no longer able to drive, when you can't get to the grocery store, when you can't rake your lawn, you know, those kinds of things. And think about that. What do you think you'll be doing when you get older? Another example here, this is one, what does it feel like to be forgotten at Christmas? That one I think is really neat because um, we could tie that into our appeal drive for the food drive. I think that's a great thing. Um, the one we used with um, – Ruth, which I had changed her name to Alice. Thanks to you, Alice celebrated her 99th birthday this year in the home where she has lived for the last 67 years. And I sent this to recurring donors. So it was appropriate for the audience, and it got them right away into the story. So you're looking for things like that that are going to hook your reader and get them to read. This next one is a little scary. This is a picture at the top of a letter. The soldiers who crucified her husband and raped her 12-year-old sister to death will do it again and again. And then they went on to talk about relief for um, these people. So, you, you know, it depends on what kind of emotion you're trying to evoke, what kind of a response you want to get from the people who are reading your letter. 
this is one of, of shock and fear. We don't want this to happen again. So here, if you donate money, we can stop these things. We talked a little bit about a picture. Remember, it's a, a picture's worth a thousand words. Avoid long shots where it's like a lot of excess background and you can't really tell what's the focus of the picture. Avoid any kind of like physical deformities, abnormalities. Don't take pictures of buildings. And again, no sexy teenage volunteers or anything inappropriate because um, people will be turned off by the picture immediately. So you want to make sure it's something that actually ties into your story, to your mission, and promotes what it is that you do and why they should support what you do. So when you're looking at your pictures, look for pictures that demonstrate a need, um, pictures that, again, evoke emotion and make it your mission personal to your reader. So some examples, I had used these before. I like these two pictures. This one is from Meals on Wheels in Colorado. And this lady looks like she's hopeful because a volunteer had come and brought her a meal. In Hunger Free Colorado, this lady, to me, looks like she's worried about what's going on. You know, what's coming next? Am I going to get another meal today? Or, you know, that kind of thing. And so these were good emotion, um, emotional type pictures for those kinds of organizations. And we could use either one of these, and I think we would be just as successful with this. So use a caption if it's appropriate. Um, sometimes I use the picture with the header, so it ties the two together into your letter. So as you're looking, um, here's some examples of ones that I just bought on the Internet. Um, I used this gentleman sitting in the chair and said that Fred couldn't get to the food pantry and needs just a little bit of help. And then we got several people who called, and this was just a plea for volunteers, several people called wanting specifically to help Fred. Fred <laughs> doesn't exist in our world. <laughs> which I never thought would happen. And, you know, so we, we told him, oh, well, Fred's already got a helper, and <laughs> we could use a volunteer to help Joe. Would you be willing to help Joe? You know, and, you know, kind of did that. I never anticipated that kind of thing. So now we print a little disclaimer in all of our newsletters <laughs> that the images are not, you know, that they are purchase stack images to protect the identity of our clients. So I wish I would have thought of that before I had volunteers asking to help poor Joe here. <laughs> But again, your picture should match your story. Really simple kind of common sense kinds of things. But as you're going through trying to get your letter together, you might forget some of these. So just make sure you find a picture that works. And if your client will allow you to use their photograph, then do that. That's fine. Yeah. But for most people, I would assume they don't want that, especially in a smaller community. So here's just a few more examples. These are from um, Humans of New York. I really like this picture of the two older ladies here walking down the street and the man with the cat. Everybody loves an animal, you know, cats and dogs and all of that. That's a good emotion, provoke emotional type photograph. So just look at that as you're coming up with your pictures. And then again, to create your sense of urgency, use emotions that make people give. Again, I thought that these were more on the negative end, but just some examples. Um, if you're looking at exclusivity, I hope you'll join in contributing or be part of the Silver Club or whatever it is. Salvation, we desperately need your help. You can help save this situation. You can be the hero of the day. Flattery, we can't continue this without your help. We need you. You need to make this happen. So, you know, as you're going through this, it's just some extra things to think of as you're writing your story. So here's another um, little example. Like, I can't believe the holidays are just around the corner. For many of us, the holiday season is festive, full of laughter, gifts, and gatherings with loved ones. We look forward to this time of year. But for many of our senior neighbors, it's a time that is dreaded because more often than not, our elderly friends spend the holidays alone. Even worse, they are having to do without, without transportation for medical care, prescriptions, and groceries without friends and family to visit with, without good, nutritious foods. The sad reality is that many of our senior neighbors are having to choose between food and prescriptions or paying the heating bill. For many, these are very lonely days without much hope. So there's your sense of urgency. There's your crisis. This is a problem. We need your help. And when you pull that in and then say you can help make the holidays brighter by making a donation or a gift of $25, your gift will purchase whatever these foods are for the holiday season. This is something that we have used in the past and um, has had great responses. So you're kind of getting a, a feel for how, you know, you, your letter should, the tone, how your letter should be written so you get it, donors to want to be part of that. Is that mm -hmm. making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So here's just some samples, um, how to create a sense of urgency. Please try to give something. I don't know that I would use a lot of these, but these were some examples. I hope you'll join in contributing. I think that's good, or supporting, join in supporting. We desperately need your help. We can't continue our work without your help. Won't you please help? And I would say, won't you help Helen, please, You know, or something like that to tie the story back in. This is your chance to help seniors like Helen. The future of Helen lies in your hands. You know, if you don't have the end of her story to share in your your appeal letter, you know, um, most of the time I will share a good outcome story. But if you don't have the end, you only have the problem. We haven't come up with a solution yet, and your donor is going to be that solution. That's where you could put that in. Um, just some examples. And again, you'll get all of this to take a look at when you, you get the PowerPoint. Um, and I know we're... Right after it's but but you don't think we should say no gift is too small, right? That's not a good idea. Or no, I wouldn't say that because it implies that you think that their gift isn't going to be enough. You know yeah. what I mean? And I, in the past, I never asked for a dollar amount, never, because I thought you know just let people give whatever they want to give. Mm -hmm. And this uh, two years ago, I went through our database and I put in. I did a mail merge with it, and I had, if you gave $25, I added $5 on. Some of them I added $10, but it was 5 and $10 increments from the last donation. So if you gave 25 your letter said, won't you please donate $30 this year, your gift of $35. And that extra $5 added on, I, we got so many donations because I asked for a specific amount. They knew they could see exactly what we need. They knew we're looking for $30. $30 is attainable. I can do that. And they may even go back and look at what did I give you last year, what did I give last month, or whenever their last donation was, and think, yeah, okay, sure, I can do that. So by doing that kind of thing in your letter, asking for that specific amount, uh -huh. to me, had much better results than just the general, please donate now, please support us. You know, and then when you go on to say any, no gift is too small, that can be insulting to some people. So yeah. I would avoid anything like that at all. Ask for a specific dollar amount. You know, and if you think you're sending a letter to somebody who normally gives ten dollars and you're asking them for twenty, if they can't give you twenty, they'll still give you the ten. Yeah. You know what I mean? So let them make that decision. But it's a suggestion, and when they know what you need, then they're much more likely to try to fulfill that need. Mm -hmm. So a template for your letter here, just real basics: a headline you want to start with, or a Johnson box somewhere in your letter. Your salutation should be to the person, not dear friend. Some kind of an attention-grabbing header to get the people to read your story. So it might be a question. What do you want? Where do you want to live when you grow older? You know, whatever it is, just something like that that gets people to start reading. Remember that your story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And even if you don't have a solution to the problem you're presenting, the end can be, and with your help, we can help Helen to be able to stay in her home or get to her physical therapy or whatever the case is, okay? You help them to see the connection to themselves and what's going on and how they can help make things better. Give a call to action or the ask. Your donation of $35 today can help us continue to provide transportation for Helen and other seniors like her. And then repeat that in your letter two or three times. You think about how many times a day do you see a McDonald's commercial or other commercials on the radio, TV, and those images are in your head. You can conjure up a picture of the golden arches at a moment's notice because you've seen it a million times. When you ask more than once, they don't have to hunt for, well, gee, how much did they want and what do they want from me? It, and it also helps to reiterate that it's attainable. It's, it's easy. It's not going to be some difficult. We're not asking for $5,000. We're asking for $25. If you have a deadline, include that in the ask. When you finish your letter and you're signing it with a regular blue pen or some other color for the holidays, if that's what you prefer, but so that it's a real, actual, live signature, not a copy, then everybody who reads your letter sees you actually touched that letter, you signed this, this is for me, and you are asking me, and it's not some computer-generated thing. Okay? And I always do it in a different color so people can tell because to be honest, black pen looks like it's copied, even if it's original, a lot of the time. So when you use a different color, it stands out. Make sure you include your PS, and then your remit envelope or device, whatever it is you're going to have them send back, make sure that ties into your letter. 
and then they have that to mail back to you. All right? When you read through and proofread your letter, make sure you do the you test. How many times do you use the word you instead of we, us, you, um, your? Your. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I was trying to totally draw a blank there. Any of those kinds of words help to draw the reader in and help them to realize that it's about them, not about me, not about our organization. It's about them saving the day, making things better. Okay? Always indent your paragraphs because that makes it easier for the eyes to scan and easier for people to read. Most people aren't going to read all of the words, but you want them to catch the main points. So make sure that your paragraphs are indented and you have main points as the start of your paragraph so they can read through and go, oh, okay, I get it. And then, you know, if they want to read more, they will. Um, I am assuming that, you know, as our country is aging and there are more and more seniors, I have this problem myself now. If you send me something that's in 10-point font, I will tell you that's way too small. I can't see that. Use 12 to 14-point font. Use something simple like Arial is the easiest to read. There's been studies done on that, but just your, your basic kind of font, nothing fancy, no script, because it's harder for people to read. And you know, the majority of your donors are older people. They are not people that have better vision than I have. Most people that are giving are in a position to give are 50 and up. Keep your lines in your paragraphs short so they're easy to read and easy to scan. Um, use subheadings, boldface, italics, task, um, italics, and even bullet points to emphasize key points. You know, like we helped Helen to bullet point get to her medical appointments, another bullet point have access to nutritious, healthy foods, uh, volunteer, another bullet point comes to visit her every week and they share the greatest stories. You know, that kind of stuff because, again, when you're scanning, you pull those things out right away and you get the point. This is how we're helping and you can be part of that. And avoid buzzwords, abbreviations, jargon, anything that people might not know what it is. Just don't do that. Skip that altogether. So what are the things you can change to raise more money? Things we talked about. Add a teaser or remove a teaser on an envelope, depending on, you know, if you've done a little bit of market research to see if this is working and you're, not, you're getting a, a lesser response with the teaser, then you might want to take it off. But add something like that to get people to open your envelope. Use live stamps to pay for your, um, and maybe pay for the return postage too on the inside envelope. I have not done that. I've only done that with surveys for seniors because um, we get a greater response when we stamp the envelope on a survey. Seniors don't want to put that stamped envelope in the garbage, but most other people don't care. So, and some donors will look at it and say, well, if you have enough money to put stamps on everybody's envelope, you obviously don't need my donation. So I don't know that the return envelope, I would not put a stamp on the return envelope. Um, increase the number of times you ask for money in the letter. If you only ask for it once at the very end, maybe do it twice. Halfway through the middle of your letter, your gift of whatever will help this person in this way. Help donors understand what their gifts will do. Spell it out. Don't make them guess. Add something and insert that the donor has to do something with. That's why you have that remit device. They have to fill that out. That's something they have to do something with. Send that back to you. It gets them physically involved. You could add a deadline to raise more money. You know, By December 20th, if you send in your donation, a generous donor will match all donations receive up to $5,000 or whatever it is. Include that. You could include a post-it note. If you do that, then you need to do it on all of them. Don't forget that. And I would say do not include your brochure. The majority of people that are receiving your letter have already heard about your organization, and if they haven't, then you would probably be sending them a little bit different letter than the rest. And your brochure doesn't necessarily help things, and it just increases postage. Um, Segment your donors. We talked about this. People who gave during the same time as last year, people who are giving monthly, people who are non-monthly donors, people who give higher dollar amounts, people who give smaller dollar amounts, and just test over the year to see what kind of response you get from different letters that you're sending to people. Karen, I know that you do this. What, how do you segment your list? Uh, normally we look at our top donors by amount, and those will be pulled out. Um, and then there's a slightly different letter that's used for people that have given within the last year as opposed to you know, people that have not given. So we try to kind of personalize it just a wee bit. Um, yep. So Basically the letter the is slightly story. different. Yep. Okay. Same, same, same story, story, but... but yeah. Right. And if you have... Now, do you have 200 
higher dollar donors that you're sending letters to? Yes. Mm -hmm. You do. So then you can still send that bulk. If you don't have at least 200, but you're really close, you know, if you have 80 or 180, I mean, just send 20 letters to yourself because it's still cheaper than buying full price stamps for all of them. That's mm -hmm. all. And it all, they just have to be the same letter. And that's some of the things that I know like smaller churches will do so they can still pay the bulk mailing rate. And just do the math and determine if that's going to be the best route for you or if it is more cost effective to pay for a full price stamp if you can't do the bulk mailing. Um, and uh, then, for again, top I would donors, I would put a stamp on because that should be more personalized. You know, their name definitely has to be in there on the postscript when I hand write that. It's yeah. all different and unique to the donor. So yeah. those top 100 donors are going to get, you know, the, the same story but different wording and per perhaps a hand-addressed right. envelope as well. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask next. Yeah, the hand-addressed mm -hmm. envelope because that will get them to open it. Yep. And if you have lapsed donors who maybe haven't made a donation this year and, or not since last year or 18 months ago or something like that, send them something a little bit different, mm -hmm. you know, to ask them to start supporting the organization again. Mm -hmm. Those are some ways that you can get a little, raise a little bit more money. Um, so we're, this is at the end. Do we have any questions? Um, well, mud? thank you very much. This is Donna, and I really do need to go, but um, it's been very um, educational, and thank you much. Thank you. You are uh -huh. welcome. There's a few upcoming webinars, and you will get this in the email, too, um, just letting everybody know. I'm going to do an Is Online Fundraising Plan Right for Me? As we're looking at the end of the year, I'll talk a little bit about the Giving Tuesday and light boxes on your websites. I'm sure you guys have seen those. And I'm going to try to come up with as much research as I can to determine whether or not it's worth your time to do this on top of everything else you have going on at this time of year. But So that will be coming up on October 22nd. Um, November 11th will be year-end receipts and thankathons and all of that. And then December 3rd will do your annual fundraising plan. Now, is anybody interested in a year-end fundraising plan webinar? If you are, I can do one, but I, we kind of passed that one up with our conference being in August, mm -hmm. and um, I had done that last year, but I didn't put it out there in case anybody wanted that. So if you do, I can. Just okay. a little not not sure at this point. <laughs> okay. And I'm sure by the time we get to the middle of September, most everybody has already thought about what they're doing for year-end, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Now, I'm going to be moving um, – what date? Next week, Wednesday. And so I will be off for a little while there that first week of October. And if I have Internet connection at the uh -huh. new house by then, then I will probably be advertising another um, uh, year-end fundraising plan webinar. I'll just go ahead and put it out there for anybody who wants it. Okay. Um, but if I don't have Internet access yet, I will be back here in Wisconsin on October 11th. And I am, I talked to you, Karen, already about um, mm -hmm. doing a program visit. Yep. So Carmen, I haven't heard a peep out of her yet, um, but if if she would like to have, um, I can hear like me. me visit. Now I can hear you. Great. If you'd like to have me visit, Karen is not too far from you, about an hour and a half. And mm -hmm. so I'm going right. to stop and see Karen, and I can come and see you um, either later in the day on the 26th of October or in the F, uh, morning of the next day, which would be Wednesday. I think the 27th. Does that sound right? Or no, Tuesday. The 27th is what that would be. Thank you. Sorry, so I was that work for you. Just let me know. I'm taking a phone call during. Oh during no call. problem, no problem. But if that if that works, because you guys are all kind of over on the same side of the state there, and not too far from one another, I can work that in, if that works for you. So Thank otherwise, you <laughs> and you'll get all of this stuff in the next five minutes. I have it all set to go. I'm going to hit send, and you'll have the webinar, and you'll see these dates, and then I'll be emailing these to everybody too. But if there's anything you need help with in the meantime, even if you just want somebody to proofread your letter or just a second set of eyes, just give me a holler, email. I can read it on my phone. I just can't. Well, I don't know when they'll have the Internet set up there. So so just let me know, okay? All right. Thanks, Kalina, and good luck with All the right. move. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.